Okay, so um, we have those practical sessions on Wednesdays, but the room is a little bit unsuitable for the practical sessions. This room is much better for having practical sessions. So what happens is um, we decided to move some of the lectures on Wednesday in the COC007 and have Thursdays for the practical sessions. So instead of Wednesdays being the practical sessions, we will have Thursdays as the practical sessions and most of the Tuesdays and Wednesdays will be lectures. Uh, that change doesn't really change any schedule or anything, it just reorganizes the when the practical sessions are. So I will update later on um, the schedule for the course because we're using the dates for the next um, lectures with the old schedule. So we will move the, we will basically swap the practical sessions six and seven, right? Um, the practical sessions, um, they cover the material which is sort of needed for doing the labs and then helping you with the project later on. Um, so I encourage everybody to attend them and you can work on your assignments during those sessions as well and you can ask the, the teaching assistants for help if you need some help or some explanations, right? Um, if you have questions, you should use the issue tracker. Um, so if there are some questions which relate to the assignments or to uh, relate to the course, post them there. Um, we have one extra teaching assistant in, in Trondheim and he can help with that as well. And you can use, um, you can use uh, Discord. So what we will do today is we will um, go a little bit through the labs. So I kind of explain a little bit lab one, uh, what is expected because there were some questions and some um, uh, some things were not clear and then we will discuss lab two and then if we have time I will kind of discuss a little bit of the code that has been recorded last year. Most of the things from last year work uh, and I've updated the uh, repository so if you go to the course repo you will have all the little uh, tutorials and all the little practical sessions that we used last year and the year before and I've updated most of them. I haven't checked the SFML. So is there anyone who works with C++ and wants to do some mobile project with their own C++ code from graphics, for example? Um, no? If there is, uh, then post a request on the issue tracker and then I will update this to make sure that it works with the latest SFML and the latest Android builds. Um, in the past, we've used SFML in graphics. It's a, like a, a library layer which isolates the keyboard handling and windowing from the actual OpenGL code. Uh, and SFML is kind of a nice multi-platform um, library which you can reuse on mobile as well. So your code, your OpenGL C++ code would then be cross-compiled and work on iOS or on Android. Uh, so we've used that in the past. Um, since the last two years, we've migrated the graphics cores to use uh, uh, GLFX instead of SFML. And um, yeah, we, we were kind of not using it, but it is like those of you who are interested in games or who are interested in writing native C++ code, then this is a, a good, um, good library to handle kind of a windowing and keyboard handling and mouse handling and touch gestures and things like that. Uh, so you don't need to do it yourself, it's kind of provided by the library. Um, similarly, Hello GNI, this one is an um, uh, example project for working with C++ code. That doesn't have to be a game, it can be anything, or it can be just a function, right? You may have some uh, computation or some machine learning, you may want to use deep learning or something, and it's written in C++ and you, you need to code it. You need to pass some data to it, call, call it, and get some results from it. Uh, so that allows you, JNI is a, a Java native interface, and it allows you to uh, mix Java code with C or C++ code. Um, we will talk a little bit about it later on in the course. We have a kind of a week dedicated to native programming and using C++ with Java. 
Uh, so this is like a very simple, um, simple project. This one, you know, that one was used for explaining the UI. Uh, this is the, the preferences, which we did last year, and we had a live session yesterday with the teaching assistants. Uh, sensor demo is for the assignment three. Uh, assignment three will be with the use of sensors. So that was sort of like a simple demonstration of how to get handle of the um, sensors and how to work with them. Threading demo is the one which we use the, the, this lecture for. So this is the uh, example of using threads and what you can and cannot do with threads in, res uh, in respect to the UI. Right, so this is the example code which the video talks about and the, the code is here. So you can uh, reuse it while you're watching the video, you can kind of play with this. Uh, and then we have two projects which were used, uh, we haven't used them much last year. We used them uh, two, two years ago. Um, there is a library called OpenCV. It, it's an Intel library which is, um, CV stands for computer vision. And this library allows you to um, do a lot of things with computer vision. So with the camera of the mobile phone and with this library, you can do kind of a neat things because the library provides a lot of uh, uh, facilities. So for example, it, it has a built-in face detection. So for example, if you have a camera see-through, you can kind of automatically detect faces and you can do something with it. So you can take an image or you can try to search your known faces or whatever, right? You can do some tricks with it. Uh, there is also um, ability to track the, um, the object. So if I have my camera fixed and somebody walks, then I can detect the motion and I can detect who is walking, right? So in the past we had, uh, it wasn't actually a student, it was a, another lecturer who used the smartphone and he was observing if foreign cats were going through the cat door to his house and he was kind of detecting if the cat is his cat which was white or if the cat is not white and then he was like doing some sounds to, to scare the other cats off right um, so this library makes it really trivial like it's like few lines of code and you can detect motion and you can detect uh, some uh, some things which kind of uh, involve a lot of math but the library already implements it right uh, so the uh, open CV yeah so this those two projects are using open CV uh, and show you how you can integrate open CV calls with your Android project and do stuff with it so the tiles puz puzzle is a, a very simple um, so if you have uh, you, you know those are uh, those puzzles where you have um, you have an image let's say you have an image of a person right or a castle or whatever, and then you divide it, let's say, into um, nine squares, and then you mangle it, and you have one empty square, and you have to drag the other tiles to re recreate the actual image, right? Uh, so this tile doesn't exist, um, and if you if you solve the, the, so this is empty, and if you solve the puzzle, you will have the image, but you start with kind of a scrambled, uh, so this is empty, but this don't show the image, they show some scrambled picture, right? Because they are moved, so you have to move the, the tiles around. So the tiles demo is basically a, a demo for doing this game on a video that you see through the camera. So the camera, oh sorry, the camera provides you a see-through and then it divides the image into a particular grid and then you can kind of play with the see-through video image and recreate the actual correct image, right? Um, so it has, um, it, it demonstrates how to do the, um, how to do this. It uses properties and it uses the open CV for the camera see-through, right? There also is a, a neat problem. So the neat problem is, imagine that you have this, uh, this image and you know one square will be empty and let's say we're using three by three. So we have nine squares, right? So now I need to scramble it. I need to generate a random order of those squares. So then it actually, the, the user has to reorder it, right? If I randomly organize those squares, how would you be sure that there is a solution, <laughs> right? 
if I, um, because for example, if I have this original image, um, I have this original image um, like this, and I left kind of uh, everything, um, so let's say we have a sound here, right? So now I have, um, so I have the face, uh, the body, the legs, uh, and there is like some tree, the tree is here, but the, um, and then there is a cloud. All right, so now I swap those two. So I swap the sun with the top of the face, right? And chances are I cannot solve it, right? This, this swap makes it impossible to kind of get back to the original position, right? So if I randomly reorganize the squares, they will be positions which don't have the answer, which don't have the correct solution, right? So how would you kind of uh, predict that your scrambling has a solution, right? So that, that is kind of one of the problems. Like if you, um, one of the solution is that you start with the original image and you just make the legal moves to scramble it, right? It's like the, with the Ruby cube. You don't disassemble it and then put it back you kind of have a correctly solved one and then you make moves which are legal and then you will know that there is always a reverse, right? Um, if you take a Ruby cube apart and put it back at random, I mean, you may put it back in such a way that there is no solution, right? Um, so it's the same here. Uh, but what else could you do? Like what else would you use to guarantee that there is a solution for the scrambled puzzle, right? You would have to have a solver which tries it and then should recognize that some of the moves are kind of illegal and then there is no solution or something like this. And uh, video playground is similar. This one is using the face detector and something else to just play with some of the features of the library. So you can do that. Um, the students who I was, I was telling you before about the project where they were detecting the, where the ball hits the board and the phone was in the middle of the board, they use that. So there is, a, um, there is the movement detector and there is a flow detector as well. So for example, I can, um, like if I have a, ca a camera watching you now uh, and you all move a little bit, right? I can detect who is moving and what is a background and what is fixed, what are the tables, even if I move my camera around, right? So be, like when I move my camera around, everything moves, but everything moves the same way. So the, the, uh, the static objects, the background and the tables will all move the same way, whereas you will move a little bit oddly, right? It's called flow detection. So flow is like uh, recognizing what is the background and what is actually not part of the background, what is the active part. So this library kind of does that for you. So it's a good, um, we, we will not have uh, labs related to this library, but it's kind of a really cute um, uh, toolbox for doing something cool with, so you may choose to do something with it for your project. All right, so going back to the, uh, and we will keep updating the repo. So um, the new uh, practical sessions will be added there as well. So uh, with the labs. So the um, one question which was asked was that some people um, for the transaction activity, so you see the transaction activity kind of looks like a table, right? And some people used a table view. It's fine. Um, it's just you have to make sure that it's scrollable, right? So you, whatever you have inside, if you have a, a table view, that it can be scrolled up if you have more transactions than fit on the screen, right? Um, so what is the disadvantage of using table view for a list that potentially has unlimited number of um, elements? You've been st stuck scrolling forever, but also what um, what happens is uh, you have um, so yeah. So what what happens is you have so you have your screen. So let's say. 
this is my activity, uh, like a fragment, which has this kind of um, uh, items displayed, right? So uh, let's say I can see, I make it big, so I only see three rows, right? So I have one row here, second row, and third row, right? And I cannot see, I, I see the beginning of the next row. So let's say I, I can kind of scroll it, right? Up and down, right? What happens is when you want to display it, like everything has to be loaded into memory and rendered before you can start scrolling, right? Uh, so the, the table view um, basically kind of loads everything. If you have thousand rows, everything has to be loaded, kind of rendered, and then prepared for ability to scroll, right? So scrolling is super fast because everything is already there, but when you click and wait for it to show up, that takes time because everything is like, has to be done before, right? So for long lists, uh, table view is not that great. Table, table view is great if you have something that you see on the screen and you don't have a lot of scrolling, right? But if you have a lot of scrolling, it consumes a lot of memory and also it takes time to, to, to show up initially. So what else could we use instead of table view? What other layouts we have at our disposal to use? So, so one is a table view. Um, Table layout. Yeah, there are some tutorials. It has, yeah, so that's just the image here. So we have kind of a, like a table layout and we can lay out the individual components. And then if we have a lot of scrolling, all of that has to be preloaded and kind of uh, rendered before we start. So what else can we do apart from a uh, table layout? Or ta table view. So we have something called list view, right? So list view it is slightly different than table um, because you see now I just have rows. I don't lay out things kind of very creatively. Each row is the same, right? So for um, uh, rendering the same kind of a list of items, the list view is, is better. Um, this one we will cover in the next week session. Uh, and we will also cover recycle view. So list view and recycler view are two ways of um, working with kind of a long list of items where you need scrolling. And what happens is when you start, uh, what it does, it does a little trick. So, yeah, so I have, again, let's say I have the ability to display four items, right? So I have uh, three items. I have one, two, three. And then if I start scrolling, it has the fourth one ready, but nothing else, okay? And actually what it does, it pre-allocates four items in memory and reuses them, right? So it, it is kind of similar with the list view, but it's not as uh, well organized as with the recycler view and you have more control with the recycler view. So for performance reasons, you should be using recy recycler view. So what it does is you have those three visible and then as you start scrolling, this one starts disappearing and this one starts showing up, right? And then as this one disappears, it is being reused for the next item which is hidden, right? 
So when you scroll up, uh, the, the invisible one is being used for the bottom. So it's being rendered with the data that needs to show up and it's showing up. This one is slowly disappearing and then eventually it disappears and goes into the pool for things to be rendered. So you don't need to reallocate memory for all thousands elements. You only need to allocate, you know, for four or five. Maybe you have another kind of a buffer at the top, right? So if you start scrolling down, you know that the next one is sort of pre-rendered. So it, it is kind of smooth. Um, and this kind of, uh, and then if you like zoom through, then Android may not render everything correctly. It will kind of reuse something. And then once you slow down, it will start rendering the stuff for you, right? So you have kind of a smooth uh, transitions of what you see to what is being rendered. And it is to, um, it, it has two purposes. One purpose is that it's, it feels very um, fast. So preparing a list of thousand elements, it, like, it shows up immediately. So it's very responsive. And the second thing is that you don't need a lot of RAM because each individual row can have graphics, can have text, can, have, can be quite memory heavy actually, right? Uh, so then you don't want to pre-allocate your RAM for all thousand elements. You want to have just a little bit of allocation. And as the user interacts with your list, it populates or uh, depopulates it. So what we do is we use this um, list view or the recycler view, and they kind of work very similarly. It's just that the mechanics is a little bit different. And then with the recycler view, you have two options. You either have this kind of traditional view, uh, list view like uh, rendering, or you're using cards. And then depending which one you want, which one you prefer, you, you use one or the other uh, mechanism and you can pre-generate some of the code using the Android Studio. So this will be covered um, in the next practical session next week on Thursday. Um, and for the lab one, whatever, choose whatever you want, right? Uh, if you've already implemented using a table layout or table view, uh, that's fine. If you want to, you if you use list view, that's fine. If you want to play with recycler view, use the recycler view. Uh, for lab two, we encourage you to use recycler view. Okay. So for lab two, you should do because you will have to have a list again, uh, and we do encourage you to use recycler view so you know in advance. Um, this activity will need all the data, right? Where is the data stored? The data is stored in memory. So we have three elements. We have our main activity, which allows you to do the transaction. And then we have the transactions uh, activity. So, so we have one activity which allows you to do transfer or transaction, and another one which is called transactions. And that shows you all the transactions that happened, right? So we have three moving parts. We have the one activity which manages um, how much and to whom you should uh, send. So you have the recipient, you have the amount, and then you have the kind of a pay button. Um, then we have the main activity, which is you know, showing you the total current balance, but doesn't show you the details of the transactions. And we have the final one, which shows you all the transactions. So now uh, we have a question. Because we're not storing and the requirement for the lab is that you should not use any persistence, right? So you cannot use files, you cannot use database, you cannot use preferences, you cannot use any persistent storage. You have to do everything in memory, right? So now the question is how to do that? Like what should be the responsibility of the main activity? What should be the responsibility of the transactions activity and transfer activity? What data should they store? What data should be passed? And what data should be passed between what, right? It's not specified. It's up to you, right? You can do whatever you want. Uh, the only constraint is that you should not use persistence, right? You have to pass data between the activities yourself. Um, so the most natural way is to have main activity being kind of the state holder, right? So the main activity will have the state of the application. It will have the current balance. It will have the list of transactions that happen. Uh, and it will kind of keep track of what is actually happening, right? If you do that, then the transfer activity doesn't do anything, right? 
what it only does is, is it shows up. It's sort of like a dialog box. It shows up, it shows you amount and the recipient and the pay button, but it doesn't have any logic. It, it's only there to collect the data and this data goes back to the main activity. And then the main activity will do the logic, which will make the actual payment, right? Uh, so this activity is doesn't have any logic itself. It is only there to collect the data. Um, and then the, the data is passed back to this activity and this activity does the logic. And then if the user clicks transactions activity, what, what needs to happen is you have to prepare this list of, of all the transactions. But the transactions activity doesn't know all the transactions. So all the transactions have to be passed to this activity from the main activity, right? So we talked about bundles and we talked about uh, passing objects around. So you have to think of how to do that, how to tell transactions activity what are the current transactions. You could say, well, because only transactions activity ever displays all the transactions, maybe main activity doesn't need to know that. Maybe main activity will tell transactions activity that transaction happened and that transactions activity will keep track of all the list of all the transactions, right? You could do that. Um, and we discussed that um, last week. Um, and you could do that with the static field, right? A transactions activity could have a static field, which is the list of all the transactions. And then the main activity would add stuff to it or remove stuff from it, right? Um, but you would have, um, the design would be then, you have something like this. Um, so we have the main activity, we have the transfer, so transfer, and the transfer as we said, it's only like two data fields you need, it's like to whom and the amount. Uh, amount and pay button. So this doesn't do anything. It just uh, shows up, collects those two fields and passes those two fields back, right? So the data flow between these two is we have this uh, to whom and amount, which this one asks and this one gives back, right? So here we will have the total, total balance. Um, we, will, we will know to whom to pay. So if we need to do the transactions, this one will be having the logic for uh, doing the transaction. Um, and then we have this transactions uh, view. So we have all the transactions here. So who should keep the list of all the transactions? Should the list be here? and then is passed to be rendered or should the list be kept here and then this function will manipulate this kind of a uh, list from another activity right um, which one feels better so this one needs to display the total balance so the total balance kind of is kept here right we have a field saying balance, right? It's fine. Um, but we have to have a field storing the list of all the transactions that happen, all the transfers, right? Um, and this list and this balance have to match, right? We cannot have transactions not adding up to the balance, right? Um, so this and this is a bit redundant. In a sense, you can always calculate the current balance by summing up all the transactions, all the incoming and in incoming money, right? So the, 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 those two have to add up. So if you were kind of a purist, you could say, well, I actually don't need a balance field. I can always calculate the current balance by summing up the how much you spend and how much money got into your account, right? Um, but then, you know, for displaying it, you would have to do these calculations every single time, right? So for the, you know, uh, for efficiency sake, you may want to have a field, which is your balance, but this function makes sure that this one and this one are updated at the same time. So it guarantees that they are in sync, right? Uh, the transaction which happens. So now the question is, where should the list be? Should the list be with main activity or should the list be with transactions?
What do you think? Yeah, and why would you try it with the main? Any other opinions? Yeah. Well, I also did it in main when I did the run, but, I, but when I'm looking at it now, I was thinking maybe some patches, just because uh, that I had it more localized in a way. Like, you know, I had the data set in front of me. You can always just send information from main to the attachment. Yeah. Yep. I, so, Either answer is fine, okay? There is no uh, strong, in this particular case, you can use one or the other and they both have merits, okay? So one reason for doing one way or the other could be that there is something called model view controller, MVC. Have you heard this term? So what is MVC, model view controller? It is a kind of a specific design pattern. What are design patterns? It's like the, is it the controller that notifies the model and the model is like the view or like? Yeah, so I kind of used a lot of words, so let's let's use this one. So we have the, the list, I don't know how is it called, transactions, transactions activity here, right? So we have our list here. So with MVC, we have to have a controller, right? So controller is controlling the model. So what is model? And then we have the view, right? So the flow kind of goes like this, right? We have data. So let's say you have a, a person, which is Joe, who is 25, and that's your model, right? So person and particular instance, Joe, age 25, that would be your model. View is you have some UI which shows you a person, right? It says, for example, name is Joe and age, is 25. So view is a particular rendering of that of the data, right? This could be people, right? So we could have a list of people, and then the rendering is a um, particular list of people. Or you may have a different view over the same model, which lists them as a tree, like a, uh, who, who is a child of whom and whatever, right? So you can have multiple views over the same model, Right? The idea is that you don't want to change the model to have a different perspective or different view over the same data. Right? And then the controller is the one who makes sure that they are in sync. Right? So the controller has access to the model and then if you says, I want to display a person, then this, the controller kind of passes the data around. Right? And we do that because it isolates how we represent the, the data and it isolates it from how it is rendered, how it is presented to the to the user, right? So, for example, a database, and then you have a particular SQL query which selects something from the database. The database is always the same, but the way you get a particular view, and in databases we do call it a view, right? Uh, it's the same idea. Uh, and then the controller is the one who glues this, right? Um, in real life, uh, what usually happens is, and in iOS, what is the default behavior, is that the view and the controller are kind of uh, glued together because, you know, they have, like, a particular controller has to know how the view works to be kind of able to pass the data, right? So, you know, there is a class called uh, view controller, and it's basically a single entity which does both, 
and then the model is a separate class, separate entity. But you can have three classes, or you could have two classes, like in this case, right? Uh, or you could glue the control controller um, with the model, right? So on Android, uh, it's a little bit tricky because if this is a list view, it needs to have an adapter and it needs it actually follows an MVC internally as well, right? So the list view follows the MVC pattern internally to display the list and it isolates the model from the view and the controller, right? Um, because the view is the rendering of it and the model is kind of a data structure which the rendering engine uses, right? Um, so internally, a list view or a recycler view uh, will use this pattern and it will have its own model. So the model, which is part of the list, is internal to how it works. For us, we kind of looking at it from the higher perspective and asking, is this model part of the main activity or part of the rendering, right? And it feels more natural to keep it inside the main activity because the main activity is the controller, right? And the transaction is just a view, right? So for us, uh, this is just the view, just rendering of the transactions. You can have multiple different activities which show you different details or different way of showing up the transactions, right? But the transactions are always the same. And then for a particular view, you would just use the same data, right? To give you an example, if you want to show the list of transactions in chronological order, you have this transaction activity which shows you transactions in chronological order. But you can imagine having kind of a field here and saying, show me all the transactions which were uh, for John, right? And then you will have a new fragment or new activity which only shows you transactions for John, right? And then this list, if it was here, and the user has this option here is like a bit of a mess because now you have all the transactions in this activity but you really need to use them in another activity and then you get kind of a trouble, right? So for if you're thinking of extending this up using different use cases, it kind of makes sense to keep the list of all the transactions in main. That's what you did, right? And it kind of makes it more robust because you can have different views over the same data and you just pass what you need to pass. If you need to pass all the data, you pass all of it. If you need to pass only Jones transaction, you pre-filter them and pass the Jones transactions, right? Um, so that decision can be done from your controller. And then the controller also has the model in it. And the view is just the rendering. So uh, one way of doing it is to keep the, the list inside the main and then pass it to the view for the, for the rendering. Um, and that's kind of a more natural way of doing it, right? So remember MVC and remember this kind of a split between the view and the data. So then you can kind of make it more uh, decoupled, right? Um, there, is one, there is one more um, uh, there was one more uh, question um, related to this, uh, and it is about the static fields, right? Because as we, as we said, you could have the list uh, inside the transactions activity. But how would you access it? How would you access it from uh, main activity? Uh, and the only real way of doing that is through a static field, right? So if I have a class, um, so this is a bit of a mess now. Let's tidy it up. So if I have one class, So I have my main activity. So I have my main uh, activity and then I have my um, transactions activity. And this is the list and this is the main menu with some buttons and the balance, right? So now this class, I, I have a class which is called something like the, the main activity. And I have a class here. Okay. 
and all the methods and all the things kind of use this instance so I can use this because I have it instantiated right um, I cannot really get handle of the instance of that of the second activity unless I have created it myself right can you create an activity yourself well you kind of can you can say new activity but we don't do that right we say start activity and Android starts an activity for us and doesn't really give us back the the reference to the activity right um, it's a little bit different with fragments right so what we could do is we could re-engineer the whole app uh, and instead of using activities we could use fragments and use the same activity and fragments you control so if I so so this you know I have handled to this activity and I can refer to it by this this inside here has its own this and I can refer to, to this but I cannot refer to another activity that that link is not possible kind of uh, instance wise Right, so instance of this activity cannot really talk to an instance of this activity. So the only way I can exchange data between the activities is through the static field. So you have a static field here, I can reference it here and I can call txsa dot, I don't know, let's call it list. And then I have it list, right? And I can do stuff with it, right? And then it would work. What, why it is not nice? why um so imagine now that i have a function i have a function um fun which does something on uh, on that field so fun doesn't take any arguments and all it does it kind of uh, accesses directly that field Exactly. It, it's effectively like a global variable, right? I haven't passed anything here. And global variables sometimes are kind of not avoidable. Like you have to use something global, like for constants, we often use global variables uh, and so on. But what, why don't we want to use global variables? Why it is a bad practice to use global variables? Yeah, exactly. Like anybody can mess up with the global variable and then you have no control, right? So one problem is that you like object oriented programming and this kind of isolation of concerns allows you to encapsulate state where it should be manipulated and nobody else can kind of manipulate that internal state of your instances, right? Only the particular class that is responsible for manipulating that state can touch it. With global variables, it's like, okay, it's un you know, anybody can kind of touch stuff, right? Yeah? Could you make the static variable private or would that? No. So if you, if you, yes, I mean, you can make it private, but then this guy couldn't access yeah, it. Can make it. Yeah, exactly. So then it's kind of pointless, right? You have to make it public for this class to access it. Uh, you could kind of make it package protected and only people from within the package would mess up with it, but it still kind of smells bad, right? And if you make um, it private, then you have like a static get function that would get. Yeah, that is the same, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so global variables are generally bad. It's, it's kind of considered an anti-pattern, right? Um, singleton is kind of considered an anti-pattern as well because it hides the fact that you have a global variable, right? Uh, sometimes singleton is fine. Like, for example, in games when you have a keyboard handler, you don't want to be very flexible. You just want one single keyboard handler, right? Uh, yeah. What is singleton? Yeah, singleton is another design pattern which makes sure that there is only one instance of a particular class. So it, it guarantees that there is a class of, you know, some class D, but this class D can only have one instance. It cannot have two instances, right? So singleton is a pattern which ensures that. Um, <coughs> So, with, if we were to not have 
a, a, a static variable. We would have to have an instance which um, encapsulates, so we would have to have some, some type, let's say type D, and some kind of object O, which we then have the list on this object, right? Uh, and then we don't have a static variable because uh, we have the instance uh, field instead. And this could be achieved if we re-engineer this and instead of having two individual activities, we actually have single activity which has two fragments. One fragment is for showing up the menu, so you would call it a menu fragment or main fragment, right? Um, fragment, and then you have this is not an activity, this is another fragment can, can be shown inside this activity. And then you have a fragment manager which manages which fragment is shown to the user. And you can have multiple ones, right? In fact, if you were working on a tablet and we discussed this and you have more real estate, you could show the main menu and list of transactions at the same time for the user, right? With the original design, you cannot do that because the, you can... you have three activities and only one can be shown to the user at a time. So even if the user takes you up to the tablet, they can only see either the main menu with the balance or the transactions, right? They cannot see both, uh, main, main menu with the transactions on, on another panel, right? But why not? Um, well, why not is because it was lab one and in lab one we wanted to keep things simple, right? If you were to do it properly, you wouldn't do three activities you would just do one activity with three fragments. And then for asking the user for the data, for the to, uh, to whom and the amount, you would show a particular fragment, hide the other fragments, and the user will tell you what they need and press pay. Then you would hide this fragment and show them the main menu fragment again. You would have the data because then it's just one single class managing all of this, right? Uh, and then you can organize it the way which is very flexible and you don't need to use static fields. You don't have these uh, global variables. Is it kind of understood? You, you get the idea? I get the idea. So if you are super ambitious, you could do lab one with fragments instead of activities and have exactly the same behavior as the lab explains, but use the fragments instead of activities to show different screens to the user, right? Uh, and use the fragment manager to hide or to, sh to, um, to show some of the things. And then if you have enough real estate, you could show to the user the main menu with the balance and the list of transactions on the, on the side at the same time, right? You could have a um, fragment manager showing the user two fragments at the same time. Um, all right, so let's have a 10 minutes break and we will talk about the um, the second second lab. So any questions about this one? No questions. What is the catch with passing kind of a long list of transactions between the um, between the activities? Yep. For example, when I do buy my lab the first time, I just simply pass all of these because I have it like in position class. Yeah. And then all of the objects across. Yeah. And then down to this then I just send the string for the estimation that the thing to be made into the display. Yeah. It gets more overhead. Yeah. That's why it's so long. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, there are some some gotchas as well because for example you if the so what what can happen is you show you say start activity and the activity shows to the user the transactions activity with the list, right? Uh, and then the user kind of finishes it, and this activity is finished, and you go back to the main. You don't know how long this original list's activity will be kept in memory. So you could cache some of the transactions in that, um, in that activity. So next time when you're starting it, you could only pass the diff, right, of what new transactions happened and keep the old transactions there. But if Android decides to... Um, yeah, to remove it, to go through the life cycle of removing it from memory, you would have to know and you would have to tell the main activity that you were actually shut down, that the cache is gone and you have to pass the whole amount, right? You understand that? Because even with the static field, you're not guaranteed that the static field over there would live as long as the main activity lives. 
The main activity may, may outlive the lists activity. If Android needs more RAM and decides this activity is not active, so I can uh, remove it from, from RAM, right? So that's why we, we do the, this exercise to sort of think a little bit of what is kept in RAM and how the information is being passed around and what is cached in particular activity. You guaranteed that the main activity be as long as the user is interacting with the app. So the main activity is not going to disappear. But if the user closes it, then again, sometimes the Android may decide to, to trash it, remove it from RAM, which means you will lose everything that this activity, the state which this activity holds. And you will see that, right? So sometimes when you sort of swipe the app off, you load it and it's just one transaction. All your stuff that you've done with it is gone. And then sometimes when you load it again, everything is there still because it hasn't been removed from memory. So the life cycle is still, you know, uh, at some point without removing it from RAM. Um, if you're using persistence, it, you wouldn't know uh, because it's kind of the same, right? All right, so let's have a break.
All right. Um, so I mentioned MVC, uh, we, which is a pattern that um, model view controller view MVC. Yeah. So you can read on the MVC uh, model view controller kind of a pattern and see how how it sort of works and you can check with uh, iOS, for example. So uh, MVC iOS. Um, so yeah, they have kind of an official developer uh, page for describing it. And then they kind of see, you know, the controller is the one who updates the view and gets the user actions. And then it updates the model and gets notification if the data changed because the data may change not only from the user, it can change from a network, for example, you got a new email, right? So some background thread will change that a user now has 10 emails instead of nine, right? Uh, so the notification kind of goes into the controller and then the controller updates the UI, right? Um, so you can kind of read about it and you should. Uh, it's one of the kind of a development skills that we uh, acquire through the, through the process. So MVC is a kind of an um, example of a design pattern. And then if, there, if you Google um, gang of four um, design patterns, <laughs> because apparently gang of four is not enough now, um, you will get to the book, which is from uh, mid nineties. Uh, and it talks about, um, uh, it's, it's called Gang of Four because there were four uh, authors for the book. And it goes through a list of um, design patterns which uh, we use in um, object-oriented programming and, and so on. And the singleton is, is here uh, and you will kind of get quite a good um, uh, overview of why we have design patterns and what, what they are for. So the, it's, it's worth of just like you don't need to buy the book because you can find all those patterns online, but it's go, go, good to go to the library and just kind of browse it. Um, that's the original kind of a book for organizing object oriented software. And you will realize that Java internally is using a lot of those patterns for a lot of things. So for example, we have the observable interface for observing some state changes of some objects. And this observable is a pattern. Uh, so Java kind of uh, standard library implements it, right? Uh, you have serializable, uh, you have uh, some inversion of control patterns and so on. So you will kind of start seeing those patterns in the standard libraries and sort of realizing that this is kind of a common way of doing something. Um, so again, I encourage you to check this out. Uh, they are specifically for object-oriented software development. Um, there is a bit of a caveat. So the caveat is that between mid nineties and you know late 2010s, we have learned a lot of things about software development and software architectures. And some of the patterns we now consider anti-patterns. So for example, Singleton. Uh, Singleton was used and highly praised as a kind of a design pattern and it has its uses, but in, it is also abused a lot and you should not abuse it, right? So sometimes some patterns are called anti-patterns. So if you Google anti-patterns, <laughs> you will have, again, a, a different perspective on all those patterns. Um, why it is important? It is important because it is, you, you never work alone. You always work with a team and you have to communicate your ideas and your constructs of how you codified something in your programs with others. And to have a kind of a common understanding and common language, we use those, the language of patterns uh, or anti-patterns. Uh, so you should, you should check it out. There is one more thing which uh, I will mention today uh, and that's uh, Solid. So Solid is another um, line of principled software development which has been developed like in the early 2000s by uh, Robert C. Martin. And if you go to his, um, yeah, if you go to, to some of his publications like this one, it's really good. It kind of, uh, it's, a, it's not a hard paper to read. 
and you can learn a little bit about organizing your software and organizing your classes and why you should do certain way certain you know using certain mechanisms so solid and this those two papers are quite good i um, encourage you to check them and what's the idea well the idea is to have a kind of a simple rules of thumb of what you should do when you're coding your classes um, and those rules of thumb are in this in the case of solid organized into five rules and the first one says you should have a single responsibility principle so s s stands for single responsibility principle and you know what it means is that you should try to have classes or interfaces doing one thing at a time you shouldn't have things which are too complex right uh, in our case for the main activity if you use the fragments suddenly you see that your main activity becomes quite complex and it does a lot of things right it manages the transactions and manages the view viewing of the transactions and managing manages the logic of what is shown to the user how the transactions are done and so on and so forth right so the single class the main activity becomes actually very fat right and it's bad because it prohibits kind of a easy maintenance and easy updates and easy testing so what you probably should do following solid you should extract the logic of how the transactions are handled to a different class and the main activity should have a reference to that class to do this logic instead of main activity doing everything right so you should isolate what main activity is for and what transactions operations are for and where they are handled right so single responsibility principle um, open closed principle yeah that one is a little bit more complex so what it means is um, your classes should be easy to extend but they should not change the uh, behavior based on some external factors right um, yeah you would have to get you have to google it and find some example code showing how this actually works in practice but what it means is that if you're designing a class and it behaves certain way then no matter what anybody does outside of this class it will always behave the same way right it sounds kind of yeah how can it not be true for everything well it's not true for everything because of inheritance and because of overloading methods right so if i have my um so the simplest way of breaking this is this let's say you have um <coughs> Let's say you have um, a class. So let, with, with object-oriented patterns, you, we always kind of deal with shapes and stuff like this because it's kind of easy to explain stuff. Um, so let's say I have a, a, a class, um, C, which has a method called uh, area, right? And this is an abstract method. So abstract. So abstract method means um, there is no implementation, right? I haven't provided the implementation for class C. And then I have another method uh, which says, uh, which kind of uh, returns a float, and it says total, total area, and um, it takes a, um, an array of C shapes, right? I have some C shapes, which implement area, and this one kind of uh, returns the total area. And now I have um, a code which iterates over the Cs and calls this method and gets the sum, right? So I have a sum which is um, for calling, calling the area method, right? Looks good? It looks good, right? But what happens is, what if we used uh, slightly different mnemonics. So let's say we are not using area, we kind of using f. And then I have the logic for this function, which does something, right? So the logic is, uh, logic is uh, um, area, right? And then I'm reusing it and I, have my uh, D which implements C so or extends extends C and this one implements the area uh, the F thing as as if the D is red tangle right 
So I have the area of the of the red stangle. So yeah, let's call it the red stangle. And then I have another one which says I'm a kind of ellipsis, right? And I also have the area, right? And then I have S, which is a sphere, right? Um, and instead of F returning the area, now F returns the volume of the sphere, right? Um, so if I have sphere and cube, um, F returns the, the volume, and if I have red stangle or uh, or something else, it returns the uh, the area, right? If I call this method now, it makes no sense, right? So the design is sort of in such a way that this method was changed. The behavior of this method was changed not by not by this method, but by the implementation of an abstract thing that C kind of depends on, right? And that would break the, the, second, uh, uh, the second principle, right? Uh, it kind of looks okay in the object-oriented terms. If you're using kind of terms like area and so on, you, you imagine that everybody will be logical and everybody will behave as you planned and they will implement this particular behavior the way you envisioned. But what if they didn't? Then suddenly your logic kind of breaks down and it's up, out of your hands, like you cannot control it, right? So open closed principle means you should have designs which don't allow that, which don't allow some of the subclasses to mess up with the core behavior of your class, right? Um, list of substitution principle, uh, that is kind of a very fancy way of saying that if you have something which holds for C, the same something should hold for R because R is a subclass of C, right? So you should be able to substitute like, um, yeah, so what it means is if I have a abstract class and I have some properties which this abstract class has, I can always put a subclass and it will al always have those properties as well, right? Um, interface segregation, again, that's kind of a fancy way of saying you should not implement something that you don't need to use. So in Java, often we have those long interfaces, um, for example, for a list, right? Um, what if you're only adding to the list um, or something? You have kind of a subset of things that you need to use. You still have to implement all those methods which list has, right? Um, and that is kind of cumbersome because your behavior, your kind of logic doesn't need that, but you still have a force to do this. So in Go, for example, those of you who had Go last semester, you realized Go has a lot of interfaces which are single method. And then if you need two, you just combine two interfaces, right? Uh, and then you never really implement something that you don't use. You always only implement stuff that you will use. So that's this. If you have an interface which is quite fat, probably you're doing something wrong. It probably should be split into two, three, four interfaces instead, right? Um, and then the dependency inversion. This one is the most important, but also the hardest in a sense. Um, what, what it means is that you have, I mean, it becomes easy if you're doing testing. If you're doing JUnit testing and you have some of the functionality that you want to test, you realize that it, yeah, your dependencies are wrong because you cannot mock things, right? So this principle basically says every time you're relying on something, you should not be instantiating it. You should be past what you're relying on from somewhere else, right? And also it means that you should not rely on concrete implementations, but you should rely on abstractions instead. Uh, because that allows you to test easily kind of a sub functionality of your code, right? Um, so for example, if you have, um, uh, you have, um, yeah, I don't know, you, you, for example, doing some uh, tax calculations. So you have a, some sort of tax calculator which takes a person as an as a, um, a input. Um, you don't really need to take a person. You need to take the person's transactions to calculate the tax, right? Uh, so you, you're relying on kind of a list of transactions, but this list of transactions can be abstract. It, it's not necessary like, and yeah, you see that with Java, uh, we have, um, so in Java, you have a array list, right? Or you have a list, uh, linked list, 
right? So you have two concrete implementations uh, for lists in Java, but when you're writing your method for accepting a list, you should just say list. You don't care how it is implemented, right? You don't care if it's a concrete array list or a linked list, because your logic doesn't really rely on the concrete, it relies on the abstract, right? Um, so the, the final thing is um, you should try to always rely on the abstract and you should always try to pass what you depended on from outside, not to have it kind of internalized, right? Um, sometimes it's not that easy, like in the case of Android, if you have an activity, you have to instantiate stuff. You cannot pass to activity, you know, what it depends on because that's how Android is organized. You don't call new and you don't pass stuff to the constructor. But in a lot of cases, you can do that. So in a lot of cases, you can uh, kind of abstract away, uh, for example, the fragments, the views, and the transaction logic. Like if the transaction logic is needed by the view, you pass it to the view. You don't kind of wire it, you don't hard code it. Like you don't say this field equals this. You kind of pass it as a method parameter. And why you do that? Well, you do that because then you can pass a mock. You don't need to rely on the concrete actual instance of something. You can pass it something that you mocked for testing purposes. So you can isolate the moving parts and just test the little thing that is in the middle. Um, so check those five as well. Uh, so check the design patterns and check those uh, solid principles because it will help you to organize your code and organize your uh, object-oriented coding, especially in Java. So you can, once you do this, you can check the anti-patterns as well. So you will have enough understanding and enough vocabulary to know what is good, and also you can learn what to avoid. Um, all right, so in terms of recycler view, uh, it's not next week, it's the following week. So not uh, 7th of February, it's 14th of February, where we have a practice practical session about the recycling review and the lists. Um, as I said, internally they use MVC as well because the, the recycler view will be a controller and the view and the model is an additional class which is injected into this uh, pattern, right? So you will kind of understand it a little bit better if you check MVC before that. All right, so what's lab two? Well, you will do a, a, a simple RSS reader. Um, what is RSS? Well, if you go to some of the sites, like uh, what sites do you read? What do you get your news from? Are you reading news? Too much, Too much? yeah. Um, I, I read Slashdot. I'm the old school guy where there was no, nothing else. Um, so in the slash dot you have um, yeah where is it you will have the uh, yeah just let me Google it slash dot RSS feed. Yeah, so you, you have um, different standards for doing feeds. Um, we have the old RSS uh, 0 0.9, we have the RSS 1.0 and 2.0, and we have Atom. And um, you can access those uh, feeds with the particular URL. So for example, uh, if you have, if you want to use Atom standard, you just use this link and it will give you XML following the Atom uh, specification and they ask you politely not to request the update on the feed more than once every 30 minutes, right? Um, you know, how often should you, sh should you do that? It's probably up to the, the user to specify it. Um, and then, because I clicked it in the browser, I, I already have it like pre-rendered. Uh, but if you use the, if you use the link, uh, and do a call, if you do a get request uh, using the um, postman, for example, you will get a structured XML which specifies all the stories and all the headings and all the stuff that you will render to the user, right? 
So the idea is that you have kind of uh, a preferences where the user can specify the URL, like for example this one, um, like this one, and it, the user can specify how many they want to limit the initial view for. So, you know, 20 top items. And then you will render it in the uh, list. And then the user can click on the, on the headings or whatever you present initially. Uh, and then you will load a, a web view and show the user the, the article. So same as, um, same as this one does. So what this one does, it doesn't have two views. It doesn't have the list and then the articles. It sort of shows the list with most of the article here, right? Uh, and then you can kind of go into the details page by clicking the this or this link, right? Well, probably, yeah, it's the same. So what you can do in your list, you can just show the title and then show the actual content when the um, user loads it. Uh, the content can have text, but it can also have embedded images and graphics or whatever the, the article has, right? So you have to render it correctly with the web view so it shows up as a properly formatted kind of HTML um, um, view. So you have the preferences page, you have the, the list, so the main menu can be just the list and then the user clicks on one of the items and you have the details of that showed up. It, um, yeah, I will change this. So I will change it in such a way that it's optional if you have three activities or if you have views, um, fragments instead, right? So for this particular app, it kind of makes sense to have fragments because you can um, do the same as with the uh, with emails. So you have uh, one activity which manages the uh, manages the main window. Then you can have the action view with the preferences here in the in the action bar. So this is generated automatically in the hello world um, activity. And then instead of having two activities, one for the list and one for the um, for the details, what you can do is you can have two fragments. And one fragment is responsible for the list of the articles. And this one is responsible for the, uh, for the details of the article. So if the user selected this title, you have this title here, and then you have the actual content, right? So you have one view, one fragment for showing the list, and one fragment for showing the details. And you can use Fragment Manager to show one or the other, depending on the state. And then if the user says back, then you go back to the list. And then if you show it on the tablet, you can show both, right? So on the tablet, you can show next to each other uh, one which is the list and one which is uh, um, the, the fragment responsible for the details. So you can have just one activity for both. You probably have to have uh, additional activity for the preferences. But again, you can manage that with fragment. There is something called fragment preferences, ah, preferences fragment, um, where you can, uh, you know, show the user the preferences and then manage everything in a single activity. Uh, so those of you who are a little bit more ambitious, you can do it the hard way with fragments. It's not that harder actually. Um, working with fragments once you understand the the flow and once you understand the fragment manager. Uh, it's, it's actually very nice. It's not much harder than working with activities directly. Um, so you can, you can do that. Uh, so then you have one fragment for preferences, one for the list, and one for the content. Um, and I will check, uh, I will change this slightly to add the point, pointing system as we did with lab one. Uh, and then there are, there are some discussions, okay? So, um, the discussion is about how often do you fetch uh, the articles, how often do you, uh, you know, how you internally schedule it, because the user will read the, the articles and then quit the app. Will you have the service behind, which will kind of regularly fetch the, the articles for the user? Uh, how would you do that, right? 
you probably the the best way would be to have uh, some prefetch uh, with the timing with the timer. Uh, so if the user says every six hours I want to get new news, then you prefetch it every six hours from the back background service. And then if the user turns the Wi-Fi and network off, the user can still read the articles like in the plane without no network, right? Um, or you can just prefetch the, the headings and load the articles when the user clicks on them. Um, there is a, a for testing purposes on the main screen you should have a fetch button so you can force the fetch of the of the new articles, right? Um, so this says final app should not have the fetch button. So why is that? So why why should you prevent? Yeah. Exactly. So it is basically to make the user comply with the good behavior of whatever because we rely on some news feeds and they have you know you, they don't want DDoS they don't want people doing that right uh, yeah exactly yes exactly so that should be managed by the developer this is something you don't really want the user to be in control of you have million users, you know, if they can do three clicks, suddenly you have three million requests to one site, right? Yeah, you should not let users kind of decide when they should or should not click on things, right? Um, so you should not have that. Uh, what's the endless scrolling? Yeah, exactly. So you can sort of uh, allow the user to refresh, right? So you probably want to order it from the uh, oldest to the newest, right? So they can always go back in time because you have already fetched it. So there is no need for fetching old stuff. They can scroll downwards as since the beginning of the app where the app started loading the news. And then when they do the app thing, you limit that to whatever you limit it, right? So if you if you hard coded that they cannot refresh more often than once every 30 minutes or whatever, then if they try to refresh the app part, it will not refresh until it's allowed to refresh after 30 minutes, right? So it, it will be fine because it will look like there is nothing new, right? User tries to refresh it, it says, oh, nothing new, right? It doesn't change anything, right? And then if the timing finishes, they can scroll down and it shows new stuff, right? If there is new stuff, because it might not be new stuff after 30 minutes. Um, so this is the reason. So um, we should use the web view for rendering the articles because that all the rendering will be done for us. We don't need to manage that, uh, which is great. Um, you have to you know, manage the XML parsing. And every year, it's a little bit of a new thing, right? Because there are new libraries, new ways of parsing XML and so on. Uh, there are some libraries which are for RSS directly. And uh, some of them can deal with RSS and Atom feeds. Some of them can only deal with Atom. So, you know, um, you should tell the user what they can put. Like, are you handling both or are you handling just one? Um, you know, think about this. Um, and then how would you make the app um, specific just for you? How would you customize it that you have features that only you want to have, right? Maybe there is a way of presenting the data. Maybe you're interested in something like in a particular authors. I don't know, like what would make it customizable just for you, right? Um, how could you handle multiple news sources? Because the, the app kind of requires you to have just one URL initially uh, through the preferences. But what would it make it much harder if you have two, three, you know, uh, uh, customizable number of news sources? Um, 
And there is also um, in the news list uh, on top, you have a single edit text where you can start typing a query. So it, it is kind of similar to uh, if you go, I'm not sure if YouTube does it. Uh, let's try Google. Yeah, so if I start typing, if I say um, Android, it kind of shows me a, a sub list of stuff that um, starts with that phrase, right? Uh, so it, it starts everything that starts with Android, right? Um, I cannot say I don't care how it starts. No, actually, I can, right? So they actually do the regular expressions as well, right? So I said, I don't care what's before, I want Android to be in the text, right? So now I have stuff which has different beginning, um, although it sort of, yeah, I don't know how they do that, right? Whether they use regular expressions or not, whether they just do keyword search and discard my prefix. But in our assignment, what we will do is we will use um, regular expressions to run against the titles or against the titles and body so you can pre-filter the, uh, the list that shows up with the news, right? So if the, the list is quite long, you can say I'm interested only in the latest earthquake, whatever, right? So you can start typing earthquake and you only will get the list which has that particular uh, hit. Um, so then there is kind of a question, how would you change it? So it's, it works more like a personal assistant for you, right? So instead of you typing stuff, maybe it can recognize like how to reorder it based on your clicking preferences or whatever, right? So those are the other two items. Uh, you know, of course, none of that is part of the lab. It's just for you to think about it, right? Um, so for example, how could you track the usage of the app? Like, can you keep track of what the user, when the user opens the app most often, right? Uh, how long the user uses it and which articles the users picks and reads and how long they spend on each of those articles, right? If you have this data, you can do a lot of things. So for example, if you see that the user always reads the news in the evening, then maybe you don't need to prefetch it by before four o'clock, right? Maybe you don't prefetch it every six hours. You just say, you know, between midnight and four o'clock in the afternoon, I do nothing because the user never uses the app. And then you prefetch it, you know, four o'clock and then 22 uh, uh, hours or something like this. Um, and if the user kind of skips some of the items, you can kind of blacklist them. So maybe some topics are not interesting for the user and you can put them at the bottom, right? Instead of on the top. So you can play with the ordering of the news items for the user. Uh, and you could use, you could extract the keywords and you could build a very simple machine learning uh, algorithm for or ordering the, the news for the user, right? Um, None of it is part of the lab, right? It's just for you to think, like, you know, how easy that would be, how hard that would be. Uh, and some of it uh, may kind of inspire you for some additional features for, for doing that, but also it will help you uh, to organize your code in such a way that is extendable, right? You don't have to implement any of those extra features, but what if someone wants to implement it? how you should code the base solution so it's easily extendable, right? Um, so, um, yeah, this one is quite practical. Uh, we, you know, you may find it to kind of to be useful for you, right? Uh, as, a, as a news reader, uh, because you can tweak it, you can kind of customize it for yourself and you can make it specific for your own needs. Um, and you can repurpose it Currently we're using, you know, RSS feeds, but you can repurpose it for any web API, uh, for example, for um, uh, music updates or for, yeah, um, yeah, for movies or for some statistics um, from Statistics Norway, you can get some kind of um, structured data that you kind of get updates for or maybe currency, um, you know, trading um, updates, right? So the mechanics are kind of similar. Um, and then you can kind of play with it and customize it for a particular thing. Uh, you can substitute RSS with um, 
Discord client. So you can observe all the Discord channels and then have a bot which kind of filters stuff that notifies you about, right? So you can have like a, some, uh, your own uh, customizable and programmable kind of a Discord reader for telling you what was important or something like this. All right, so any questions about this? They will be later, I'm sure. Um, so think about it. Um, and if you have questions, just post them onto the um, post them onto the uh, issue tracker. We will have, as I'm saying, some practical sessions related to SQLite, to persistence, because you want to store those articles somewhere. You're not going to store those articles in preferences. You, you will store the user preferences in preferences, but the actual articles you will store in a database. Uh, that's the most logical way of storing it, right? Uh, so we will have session on SQLite, how to do that. We'll have a session on the recycler view. We'll, we already had a sessions for the async tasks and for doing some background things, for fetching the data, for doing like a URL requests. Uh, we will talk a little bit about XML and JSON later as um, Christopher will talk next week about services and running background services. Uh, this task doesn't rely on any notifications at the moment. Uh, I may add it as an extra bonus things that when there are new news that you haven't seen yet, you will get the notification that there is like four new news items after the latest um, fetch that you've done, that the app did. Uh, so Notifications we also covering um, next week, I think. Let me double check. Yeah, so notifications will be after services. So persistence is next week with services and then notifications and JSON and XML uh, and fetching resources from the web is done the following week. Right, so we kind of trying to have the building blocks done in the practical sessions and in the lectures, and that should allow you to do the, the lab. Um, all right, so that's it. Uh, if there are no questions, that's it today. <laughs>